Um, and um, I'd really, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Susie Arnold. So we're so excited that Susie's able to join us. Susie's a marine scientist at the Island Institute where her work is on the impacts that climate change and ocean acidification have on marine resources and fishery dependent communities. Her current areas of focus include working with fishermen to diversify their business to include shellfish and seaweed aquaculture, researching the environmental benefits of farming edible seafood and helping coastal communities better understand the implications of sea level rise so that they can make informed adaptation decisions. Um, Susie earned a master's degree in marine policy and a doctoral degree in marine biology from the University of Maine. She also lives in Bath and so we're excited to that she's able to share her insight as a resident of our area as well. Um, so welcome Susie and thank you so much um, to everyone for joining us this evening. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth and Becky, for inviting me tonight. Um, one um, thing, word that was misspoken, Ruth, edible seaweed, not edible seafood. We hope that a lot of seafood is edible. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else caught that, but just wanted to clarify. <laughs> um, so yes, thanks again for um, having me. Nice to see some of you. Um, I can only see a few people in my little screen. So I'll be, I'll be talking to you, but recognize there's a lot more people back there. So thanks all for joining. Um, tonight, I'll be talking about sea level rise on the main coast, understanding the risks to plan for change. So as um, Ruth mentioned, um, I am the marine scientist at the Island Institute. Just figure out, there we go, how to, can you guys see my arrow when I move it around on the screen? Great, okay. So uh, for those of you not familiar with the Island Institute, we are a community development organization based in Rockland, Maine. We've been around for 40 years. Um, we serve Maine's 15 year round unbridged island communities as well, as well as all of the other coastal communities of Maine. We have these three pillars of work, strong leadership, climate solutions, and resilient economies. We have a staff of nearly 50. Um, plus about a handful or two of island fellows that are based in communities for a couple of years that help on a specific um, community development related project. So we work in teams at the Institute on topics ranging from sea level rise resiliency to ensuring broadband internet access for all Maine's coastal communities. So as Ruth mentioned, I'm the marine scientist. I work on the um, climate impacts on fisheries and fisheries dependent communities. So. Uh, I also serve on Maine's Climate Council. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Climate Council, and for those who aren't, I'll give a little, a little bit of background. Um, the Maine Climate Council was formed a couple years ago under the Janet Mills administration. Um, it works through the volunteer efforts of a lot of people, plus a lot of state agency staff and um, nonprofit staff like myself. So I serve as the co-chair of the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. Um, and I'm also the liaison um, to the Coastal and Marine Working Group. So basically make sure the information is shared between the Coastal and Marine Working Group and the STS, which is short for Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. So we've been hard at work on the Maine Climate Council for a couple of years now. Um, producing Maine's Climate Action Plan, which was released just over a year ago in December of 2020. It's called Maine Won't Wait, and it's called that for a reason. It's all about our emissions reduction goals over the next uh, 30 years and all about helping Maine communities adapt to the changes that are already baked in due to climate change. So I helped to produce this document on the left, which is the Scientific Assessment of Climate Change in its effects in Maine. This was produced by the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee, uh, released to the Maine Climate Council in um, basically the, the summer of 2020. And um, much of the contents of, of this report, as well as all of the reports coming out of those six working groups you saw on the previous slide informed Maine's Climate Action Plan. So if you haven't seen the Climate Action Plan, it's a, it's a thick, it's a thick plan, but it's really readable and very well designed. So I, I really do recommend it. There's a lot about sea level rise in there. And so I'll do my best to summarize what I thought would be pertinent in terms of sea level rise for the audience tonight. So assuming I'm not talking to a bunch of um, oceanographers or physical um, marine oceanographers, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the causes of global sea level change. 
And there are two tr primary drivers of what's causing um, global sea level rise. One is volumetric increase of the ocean. So more volume caused by melting land ice entering the ocean and increasing the volume. The other one is, is thermal expansion. And this just means that as the water is warming because of global warming, um, the ocean is warming and it is expanding as it warms. So these two things contribute most to, sea, to global sea level rise. There's also other local factors like atmosphere ocean interactions and more locally and important to the Gulf of Maine is ocean circulation patterns. This is a, a big thing here in the Gulf of Maine, which I, I won't get into how that ties in, but, but know that there are these other uh, factors that do contribute and cause uh, some variability in the, um, the rates of sea level rise around the world. So here in Maine, we're fortunate to have six tide gauges. So this is how we measure sea level rise. Um, it's very measurable. Uh, we have six tide gauges all the way from the border of New Hampshire up to the Eastport, Eastport and Cutler. Uh, these data are showing um, the Bar Harbor tide gauge. And you can go, if you're interested, to your most local tide gauge by going to the Maine Sea Level Rise dashboard. You could just Google that and this will pop up and then you can plug in which tide gauge you wanna look at. Um, this one happens to be data from Bar Harbor. That tide gauge has been in place in, since 1947. There are tide gauges like the one in Portland who have been in place for longer. Uh, that one is like uh, 1911 or 1901. It's, it's been in place for more than hundred years. This one's been in place for about 75 years. And these are the types of information you can see on the dashboard if you go there. And what you're looking at here is um, monthly mean sea level rise um, kind of over time. So since this tide gauge has been around, this is the historical average here. And what you can see here in red are the years for the highest monthly means. So months are down here on the x-axis. And in the blue, you see the years that have the lowest monthly means for that month. So you see a lot of uh, years in the early 1900s for the minimums and a lot more re recent years for the maximums um, because we're seeing increasing sea levels. And if you look at the black line, this is showing the last year. So this is 2021. If I chose 2022, you'd only see one or two dots here. So it's not that informative. But uh, the point is, is that uh, the rates are accelerating and we're seeing higher sea level rise higher seas more recently. If you look over to the figure here on the right, you can actually see the elevation um, as reference to the long-term average and see how sea level rise is going up over time. And this red line is the last about 20 years of data. And you can see that the rate of rise is increasing. So the blue line uh, dating back to 1947 you could see the rate is 2.25 millimeters per year. If you look more recently, over the last 25 years, you can see the rate has increased to 3.09 millimeters per year. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you look at it in inches over here, you can see we went from eight inches per century to about 12 inches per century. And unfortunately, these rates are predicted to continue to increase. And uh, just to put it another way here, what you're looking at here is um, highest monthly means. And again, you'll notice like, so this is for all six of Maine's tide gauges. And what you're seeing is a, a lot of years in the 2000s on a lot of 2021s. And what this means is that 2021 broke a lot of records at all of the tide gauges up and down Maine's coast. I mean, if you look at the month of October, October had the highest monthly mean sea level rise since records began. In, at every single tide gauge along the coast of Maine. So what does that mean for the future? Well, we have future sea level rise scenarios for Maine that are based on emissions data and basically go out to the year 2100 here. And just minimize that, there we go. Um, and what you can see, no, I can't see anyone. Um, what you can see is that what Maine has adopted for its planning uh, targets are the intermediate scenario of sea level rise. And that is uh, 
a 1.5 foot rise by 2050 and a rise of four feet by 2100. And then the Climate Council suggests that we prepare to manage for the high scenario, which is three feet of sea level rise by 2050 and nine feet by 2100. Now, there are some pretty scary uh, statistics that are outlined on this uh, dashboard. This is another one of those interactive dashboards that if you Google, you can, you can get to and you can play around uh, with the different scenarios at the different tide gauges. And essentially uh, what it says here is that basically with 1.5 feet of sea level rise, we'll see 15 times more nuisance flooding than we do today. With four feet of sea level rise, 75% of Maine's dry beaches are inundated. And then under the high scenario at 2100 with nine feet of sea level rise, you'll see 98% of Maine's dry beaches are inundated. So on this graph here are the intermediate and high scenarios. These are the ones that have been incorporated into the planning targets. There are low scenarios and there are extreme scenarios. Uh, but this is the these are the planning scenarios that were recommended by the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee and that were, were adopted by the Climate Council and have now um, been mandated to be incorporated into um, all state agency laws. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. So usually when I show people those figures, they say, well, what does that mean going forward for my community or for my house? And um, this is where I tell folks to go to find out um, the, the answers to those questions, or at least get an idea of what can be expected. And these are called map viewers. The one that I like to advise people to go to is the one managed by the Maine Geological Survey. Um, if you Google Maine Geological Survey, sea level rise viewer, you'll be able to find it. You can type in your town and you can zoom in, zoom out. You can probably find your own house. Um, then you can go over to the layers list. What you're looking at here is um, the highest astronomical tide plus 1.6 feet. So basically, uh, this is the um, this is kind of the scenario going out to 2050, which is that intermediate scenario that we're we're planning to manage for by 2050. This is the city of Bath, and you can see the greens here are um, water inundating at that. 1.6 foot level. And so you can see water coming in. This is already a trouble spot for those of you who live in Bath and know the Kennebec Tavern area. But over here on Water Street also, there's, there's some standing water there. So moving on to um, another example that you can play around with with these, these layers. This is the highest astronomical tide plus four feet, or essentially the high scenario going out to the year 2100. Again, same location in Bath, and you can see that the inundation um, is much more substantial. Now I zoomed out here, and then I went to the, to the high scenario out to 2100 for that um, nine foot um, level of sea level rise. And obviously the flooding is much worse. You can see Bath Iron Works down here, but why I zoomed out is that you can see well, if you live, you know, if you live upland, you might think you're high and dry and um, your house may be high and dry. But something else to consider is that even if you uh, you aren't getting wet or maybe even your downtown isn't getting wet, the access road to get to your home or to get um, to get anywhere may be blocked or may be flooded. And so this is another place where I like to send people just to get a a sense of what their vulnerabilities are. And this is another viewer. This is called the Coastal Risk, Risk Explorer. It, it was created by the Nature Conservancy in Brunswick with a bunch of other partners, including Bowdoin College. And essentially, same, same idea. You can type in your town and you can zoom in and out. And you can use this little ticker over here. And I've ticked it up to two feet of, of uh, relative, relative sea level rise. And I've zoomed in on the north end of Bath because in that, that last map viewer, it looked like if you lived in the north end of Bath, uh, you're probably high and dry, uh, which is the case for your home, but it's not the case for your access road. So what you see in red here, uh, this is indicating a section of road that is cut off under two feet of sea level rise. 
And if you go over here, you can see that that leaves 91 addresses inaccessible to emergency services. And then there's some approximate costs to upgrade those inundated roads, which are very much a, uh, an estimate. Um, when I give uh, talks about sea level rise to any community on the coast of Maine, unfortunately, the example that I use is actually quite local to Bath. It's not that one I just showed you, but it's over in Arousic. And the reason being is because Maine has, as you know, a lot of peninsular towns where there's one way in and one way out. Um, and Arousic is an important example of this, is that uh, early on, on Route 127 going down uh, through Arousic to get to Georgetown, there's a low lying area of road. And so if you zoom into that area using this viewer, at one foot of sea level rise, I mean, this is what it already looks like um, sometimes over here on the right. At one foot of sea level rise, it's, it's not inundated all the time. However, if you go, and, and so only four residences, I think uh, over, over here, this may be Spinney Creek Road, I'm not exactly sure. You'd have to zoom in there. I'm not as familiar with Arousic, but uh, if you tick it up to, no, this is just here, just showing that these cost estimates are very much uh, um, estimates and they're kind of conversation starters just to get a sense of what we, we might be talking about to upgrade the roads that are inundated under the certain level. So if you tick it up to two feet, you can see here um, that, that that bottleneck is cut off. And it's this bottleneck here that is basically cutting off 932 addresses to emergency services. So just indicating that while all these houses are likely um, not being directly impacted by sea level rise, the access road to reach them is, and that's, a, that's obviously an issue. Um, and thus far, what we've been talking about is, is really just the, the rising seas without storm surge or without surges on top of it. So I think it's important to mention that obviously we have storms, they are becoming more frequent. Um, so we have storm surge and we have storm tide. So basically storm surge is basically an abnormal rise of water generated by a storm over and above the predicted astronomical tides. And um, storm surge shouldn't be confused with storm tide. Uh, which is defined as the water level rise due to the combination of storm surge and the astronomical tide. So basically, if you have a predicted high tide of 10 feet with a four foot surge on top, you have a storm tide of 14 feet. And so you'll hear this language a little bit uh, in the presentation. I just want to make sure folks understand that. So um, something that has really resonated with me that I've heard others present on is the fact that we have been very lucky to not have a big storm on top of a high tide or heaven forbid, on top of a king tide. And the fact that Maine has uh, basically not experienced a superstorm doesn't mean that it can't happen. It just means that it hasn't happened. And we've been lucky because we have this huge tidal range. So if you look back in history, you know, that in 1976, we experienced uh, like a hundred year storm and the high tide was 13 feet and the storm surge on top of that was two and a half feet resulting in a storm tide of 15.5 feet. Now, if you look at, and, and this is data based on, um, on Bar Harbor and the tide gauge up there. So if their, their king tide up in Bar Harbor is 13.7 feet and the highest surge recorded in Bar Harbor is 4.9 feet. And so if you had those things occurring at the same time, you'd have a storm tide of 18.6 feet, which is actually th over three feet above what was experienced during our 100 year storm. So that is, that's a possibility today, not including sea level rise and something that we need to be aware of in terms of our, our ability to respond to an emergency like that. Uh, just, I think maybe one more piece of uh, bad news before I get into the, the good news of the talk. And that is something that's also important to consider, which is the changes in storm tracks and activity. So some background about tropical cyclones and their activity in a warming world. So we know already that there's an increased occurrence and intensity of 
of the most intense tropical cyclones. We know that there's increased precipitation associated with these storms and that there's increased storm surge flooding associated with these storms. There's been a, a bunch of new insights in the last year. And then a, another paper was published with some similar findings just last month um, showing that the tracks of tropical cyclones are shifting poleward and westward potentially impacting unprepared regions not typically affected by intense tropical cyclones. And so tropical cyclone activity close to land is increasing and we're seeing increasing stalling of these Atlantic tropical cyclones with a substantial increase in risk to coastal regions. So all these figures down here are showing basically the distance from land is decreasing over time, meaning they're closer to land. A higher percentage of them are entering the coastal region over time and the time they're spending in coastal regions is, is increasing, which is that stalling I was referring to, which could mean a whole lot more water is dumped on our region of the country than has happened in history and that we're used to. So this adds to what um, this figure, is, this table here is showing, which is basically changes in annual flooding frequency with sea level rise. And these data are for Portland, mind you, based on that tide gauge. And so just for context, in the, about the last 100 years, we've been seeing on average about three flooding events per year in Portland. If you look at the data over this decade here, 2006 to 2016, you can see we have increased to about 10 events per year. In Portland. You may have attempted to travel to Whole Foods sometime during one of these events, and that whole intersection is underwater because the ocean is coming up through the storm drain in that area of Portland. Um, if you add a foot of sea level rise on top of that, uh, you get 98 flooding events per year. And if you add two feet of sea level rise on top of that, you're up to um, basically um, more than one event per day. So again, with two feet of sea level rise on a calm day, Portland could see this type of flooding more than once a day. Now I can't liken that directly to the flooding that we see somewhat frequently here in Bath because we don't have a tide gauge here in Bath. We also have uh, one of Maine's largest rivers and it's very uh, dependent upon precipitation. So we have a lot more variability in our local flooding, but we can expect something like that uh, increase in frequency of flooding here in Bath as well, obviously depending upon storm surges and precipitation and, and how much that river is bulging. So what are we to do? We know now that we have these central planning estimates here in Maine. So the state is committed to managing for a foot and a half foot and a half of sea level rise by 2050 and four feet by 2100. And we've been advised to prepare to manage for three feet by 2050 and nine feet by 2100. So how do we go about managing and preparing for something like this? Well, this is what it used to be like. And, and, and now I'll get into the good news. So, so we've made a lot of progress towards improving coastal resilience. And if I was presenting the same talk three years ago, I wouldn't have said this is this is no longer the case. But this is the comic reads. This is a state agent or government official over here. This 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 person here. We can give you a grant to study your community to find out what's vulnerable. And then this person over here here says, and to fix it once we know. And she says, well, you're you're on your own for that. And he says, oh, but that's the expensive part. And that was kind of the case the three years ago, three to five years ago. Uh, there was a little bit of money available to do a vulnerability assessment, but it was very difficult to find the, the funds, which are often in the millions of dollars, to actually implement some of the strategies that a vulnerability assessment might suggest the town takes. So previously, the probably the most common um, available funds for coastal communities was through the Coastal Community Grant Award. And um, basically this figure is just showing you in the mid coast towns that it were awarded coastal community grants. And the yellow boxes indicate those were grants that were for coastal resiliency. So this used to be one of our only sources of, of funding for, for planning around coastal resiliency. Now, fortunately, a lot has changed. Uh, particularly recently, we've been hearing about the influx of a lot of 
uh, funds coming from the federal government and into the state. I'm not going to go through this whole slide here. Um, and I know we have folks on the call or on the in the audience who would be able to, to advise you even better than I on um, the availability and the timeline of some of these funds. This slide comes straight from a presentation that happened last month to the Marine Resources Committee of the Legislature. Um, and it was an update on some of the federal infrastructure funds and some of the updates to the main state budget, all of which are going towards um, some aspects of coastal resiliency. So the point being is that there is now a lot more money available for communities to actually take um, um, take uh, take steps towards implementing some of the strategies that come out of these planning studies. And a point that I'd really like to emphasize is that the further along a, a community is in planning and assessing their vulnerabilities and knowing what the next steps could be, the more likely they are to be well situated and prepared to receive some of those um, bigger dollar um, grants and, and um, other funds coming from the federal and state governments. So I, I'm gonna breeze over the next couple uh, slides because if you're not a planner, you might not ever use these, but it's important for people to know that they exist. There's a, a couple of resources that have been around the state for several years now um, to help communities plan. And one is the guidance series for Maine communities. And this is, is really integral when it comes to integrating climate adaption, adaptation into existing local policies. So for instance, adding, um, adding climate resiliency into your comprehensive plan there or, or um, creating uh, ordinances in your town. There may be draft language already created so that communities aren't having to recreate the wheel. Um, another resource that's been around for a while that I highly recommend is something called the Maine Flood Resilience Checklist. And you can see here, I, it, it, what is it? It's a practical self-assessment tool for um, basically examining your risks, assessing your vulnerability and identifying strategies. Who should use it? I would say every community should use it. It's, um, it can be done in a matter of uh, hours or maybe like a full day workshop or a couple half day workshop workshops. Um, and it can be really informative in helping communities determine uh, their priorities for um, climate resiliency. Uh, this is a new resource that has just been released, and I mention it today for, for everyone in Maine, but particularly because I know that the city of Bath is uh, planning to enroll. Um, so this is a resource that's been made available. It was released, I think, in December from the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, often referred to as GOPIF. It's called the Community Resilience Partnership. And... Um, Basically, there are three steps that a community needs to do to enroll in the partnership, including completing a, a self-evaluation, holding a public workshop, and then adopting a municipal resolution. And then once enrolled in the partnership, a community would be eligible to apply for a community action grant. And these grants are, if you go in it alone, they're up to 50,000. If you pair with another community, they can be up to $100,000. Um, and I know that as Ruth mentioned, um, Bath's going to be holding a, a public workshop next week, and I think they're hoping to apply for a community action grant for this upcoming March 22nd deadline, which is super exciting. If a community is not able to, you know, if it's a small community like the ones the Island Institute works most closely with that don't have a lot of municipal capacity, there is the opportunity to have a, a service provider who can help guide you through this enrollment process. And there's also regional coordinators that can um, play a similar role. So there, there is uh, added capacity to help communities join the resilience partnership if they don't have uh, that, that type of capacity within their um, town government. So I wanted to just spend a tiny bit of time on um, Bath and the actions that Bath has taken before I jump to another couple communities that I'm a little bit more familiar with in terms of the action that they've taken to address sea level rise. Uh, but I think Bath has 
taken some great, really important steps. Um, they have a climate action plan. Uh, they have um, a newly formed or a couple years old anyways, uh, climate action commission. Uh, like I mentioned, they're gonna be hosting this public meeting to um, discuss possible priority actions that the city might take to address climate change. And that's at six on March 10th in the city hall. Um, something that I wanted to mention that Vinyl Haven has also gone through is this design and resiliency team exercise. Um, it's a project of the American Institute of Architects and a couple other um, co-sponsors. And what I like about the work of, of this DART group is that they come into your community and they do these visioning workshops. And I did attend the one in Bath and it was really interesting. I think the reports are, um, you know, this was done back in 2014 and I still like to refer to them. And I think Vinyl Havens was also in 2014 or 2015. And I think the illustrations that are in the report and some of the ideas that, that they talk about are really, really kind of um, out of the box ideas in terms of green infrastructure and how a downtown area can live with the water that is going to come. And so this is an example of a sketch from that report. They talk about these green fingers. So this is like green spaces, green infrastructure. This is an example of, this is not a sketch of Bath, but this is an example of green infrastructure in another city. And they talk about the blue fingers. So the blue fingers being where the water is going to go. And then the green fingers are the the green that like the um the plants that are helping to buffer the city and absorb absorb that water so i think that this is a strategy that's going to be really important to have a combination of hard infrastructure like seawalls with this green infrastructure that allows um, cities like bath and potentially vinyl haven and, and damascata that i'll get to next um, will need to incorporate to um, into their cities going forward so I'm going to talk a little bit about Vinyl Haven, which is an offshore island in Penn Bay. Uh, they have remarkably been um, been a real leader in um, sea level rise adaptation and understanding their vulnerabilities. And one of, we're one of the first communities that I'm aware of to have a sea level rise committee. It's because their whole down street, which they call their downtown, uh, their whole street is really vulnerable to, to flooding already. Um, their ferry terminal is quite vulnerable and it's really the, the heartbeat of, of their island. Um, and it's that area that is most vulnerable to, be, to being um, inundated and it's happening now. So they've been really proactive and have been a leader in taking action. Um, they partnered with Ransom Engineering through a coastal community grant to do an assessment of their downtown. And this is an example of what the engineers are creating and advising. Um, and they are currently receiving funding to upgrade their, um, elevate their sidewalks downtown and are taking kind of small incremental steps as they have to do capital improvements in their downtown. They're absolutely considering sea level rise every step of the way. So they've been a great, a great model for other small communities. Uh, the Damascata downtown is also quite vulnerable. Uh, it, it's parking lot, which is, which is here is um, flooding at high tides and uh, the whole downtown is extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. If you can see, this is blocking it on my screen, but here is uh, an example of what their town looks under um, different zones from the FEMA flood maps. And so you can see that uh, all, all of these are basically their, their, business, uh, their businesses and you know, some residences on the second floor, but um, they worked with Maloon and Mc Malone and McBroom, probably pronouncing that wrong, Malone and McBroom, um, that's an engineering company that does this type of work as well. And they came up with two options uh, for Damascata, one of which was to flood proof each individual building, and the other which was to um, elevate the parking lot and put in a seawall. And so that was option one. Um, the select board was much more in favor of that option than the elevation of all of these historic buildings or, or the flood proofing rather of all of these historic buildings. Um, but it, it took years for Damascata. So that study was done, I don't know if it says, yeah, in 2014. And just, um, just uh, almost two years ago, they finally received some funding through 
um, the Economic Development Administration $3 million to make those um, infrastructure upgrades, including the flood wall um, around the parking lot to protect their downtown. So that's a success story of a, of a small town that you know, basically had done all that planning almost a decade ago, and it took them, oh, what, six, six or seven years to figure out how they were going to raise the millions of dollars needed to implement the strategies that they've known about for, for quite some time. So I just threw this, this assessment that, um, that the town of Stonington did. They did an adaptation report with GEI consultants, which is another great firm that um, some communities are, are working with. And I threw it in here because they did um, basically looked at vulnerable roads in the town of Stonington and the consultant prioritized based on um, how many residences were being cut off, uh, if there was a detour available, basically like how much the road would need to be um, raised under different scenarios in the future. And, um, I just think it's a really interesting look at, you know, Stonington's a small town. There's a lot on this list to do, and it's really difficult to prioritize. And I, so I think the prioritiz prioritization discussions that communities are going to have to have are, are really important, and they're going to be really difficult. And I think that that's something that can't be ignored. I think navigating some of these difficult conversations is going to be one of the hardest steps that we have to tackle. Um, and so I'll put in a little plug on that note. I'll put in a plug for a documentary that the Island Institute produced with, uh, well, it was produced by Beachwood Films. The Island Institute um, contracted this film company on North Haven to do a documentary of the process that Vinyl Haven has gone through. Um, as I mentioned, Vinyl Haven's downtown is very vulnerable. There's, um, there's some thought of whether it makes sense to move the downtown or whether it, it would be possible to save the downtown. And so it's obviously a really, um, a really important conversation for the community and, and one that I'm sure there's not perfect alignment on what, what actions should be taken to, to, save, to save their community their downtown and to make it look like um, in the future something that people value. Uh, so anyway, it's it's about, I think, 12 minutes long and um, it discusses some of the, the hard conversations that will be required to be discussed uh, in a community that's grappling with, with um, climate resiliency. So just a couple more slides, uh, a few ideas about how you all can stay connected and get involved. Um, I would encourage you to follow the Maine Climate Council. There's, they've done a great job of creating some really um, appealing um, visuals on the website. They also just create a really motivating documentary about climate action in Maine. Um, another resource is, is the Maine Climate Change Adaptation Providers Network. This is open to everyone. Uh, it, it originated as more of a like technical server services group, but um, pre pandemic, we were getting out to communities and doing field trips and um, involving all sorts of folks. I hope we get back to those in person field trips soon. So this is a um, this is a good resource. The Island Institute also um, organizes something called the Shore Up Maine Google Group, and that's basically a Google group, which is an email listserv to share information about um, sea level rise in Maine. And so it's just a way to, to stay connected with, with, uh, um, with the most current literature, uh, events, webinars, that sort of thing. And another way to stay connected is to to follow what's going on in Augusta. And sometimes that's easier said than done. I know I was trying to track down this particular bill today to be able to report the absolute latest. Um, so something that came out of the, the work of the, the Climate Council and the Climate Action Plan was their, the requirement or legislative resolve um, that was passed last year to require main state agencies to incorporate those sea level rise planning targets into their regulations. And so a whole bunch of state 
agencies like DMR, Maine Department of Marine Resources, Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, Department of Transportation, um, and Department of Environmental Protection had to review their regulations to make sure that they were in line with these planning targets. And so there is now um, this LD1970 um, under discussion at uh, in the Environmental and Natural Resources Committee of the main legislature. And they had a public hearing on Monday and they actually had a work session yesterday and voted on it, but I think they voted it out of committee, which means that there'll be more discussion on it. So anyway, another way to stay current is to follow what's going on in Augusta and how, um, how these um, recommendations from the Maine Climate Council are being incorporated into legislation. So finally, I like to end on, um, because this is, this is a really heavy topic, and I think we all recognize that, and um, I've been reading more about climate anxiety and how sharing this kind of doomsday information about um, climate impacts that we can come to expect can be really uh, anxiety provoking. And that is definitely not the point of sharing this information. It is The point is to motivate us to take action. And so um, I wanted to end on some personal choices that we all can take to reduce our contribution to climate change. And this is um, kind of an easy way to look at our actions and what makes a big impact, like things like having fewer children uh, has the biggest impact that you can personally take on your emissions um, to all the way down to upgrading light bulbs. That gets a lot of attention, but if you look where it, where it falls on this kind of scale of, of emissions reductions, it's, probably not the most important action that you're taking. Um, so hanging your clothes, recycling, washing in cold water, replacing your traditional gas or diesel car with a hybrid, eating a plant-based diet, switching to an electric car or going car free is the most ideal, uh, avoiding air travel, um, purchasing green energy, these are things that start to really add up on an individual basis. So um, I think that's my last slide. And I'd be happy to take any questions and hopefully left you feeling motivated and, and not discouraged about, about what we're facing. I know it's a heavy topic, so thank you. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, if folks can put your questions into the chat, we do have some questions that people had sent in beforehand. So I might start with a couple of those, um, but if you add them into the chat, um, we'll read them out from there for Susie. Um, so we had a couple questions related to town planning. Mm -hmm. um, one was about um, someone who lives in Arousic mentioning that they're very familiar with that Route 20, Route 127 flooding that you showed. So they're mm -hmm. interested in learning if there's someone, maybe at Maine DOT or somewhere else, um, who's working on long-term plans for solutions to issues like that. Do you know where, do you know if anyone's doing that work or where people would go to learn more about that? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, Bruce Van Note is the commissioner of the Maine Department of Transportation, um, and he's on the Maine Climate Council. It, I don't know if he would be your your first go to person, but certainly the Department of Transportation would would know um, where that route falls on the priority list of projects for DOT. Um, I certainly don't know where it falls, but um, that would someone at DOT would be the first place I would go. We had another question about town planning um, from somebody in the Rockland and Rockport area. They are wondering, um, what's the best source to find out about risk to their community? Oh, in Rockland? Um, they have, Rockland has a committee. I'm not sure what they're calling themselves. Uh, there's, some towns are sea level rise committees. Some towns are climate crisis committees. Bath has the Climate Action Commission. So I'm, I can't remember the, the language of the committee in Rockland, um, but you could certainly, oh, and I'm blanking on the woman uh, 
that I would refer you to. I would look on the, the website for Rockland and just find out who the, the planner is or if the, commi the committee is advertised. Um, I mean, I know Rockland's waterfront is undergoing a whole bunch of changes right now because Island Institute is based in Rockland. So I have a, a, an understanding of all of the projects that are, or a, some understanding of some of the projects that are going on there. And I know there's a, there's a lot. I know that Rockland was involved in a, a working waterfront infrastructure project that was um, run by the Maine Coastal Program. And so there's a report that has come out on that. Um, yeah. Uh, Again, I would refer to that committee, which I'm blanking on the name of it. We had um, some questions about individual planning and maybe I can combine both of these together, but they were asking about basically what do people do to protect private property from flooding? And, or are there resources or a place that you could direct people to go to look for information about that? Well, it totally depends on what part of your property is vulnerable? Is it your is it your well? Are you suffering from saltwater intrusion? Is it a bluff that's being eroded? Um, is it is it you know your your dock that's in, being ripped off at astronomical high tide? So that's a tricky one too. And there's not you know this is a this is a really big issue. Obviously, I mean, the institute the, the island institute works with coastal communities, so we really have. And what I mean by that is we really have a focus on mun municip municipal governments taking action and also like critical businesses and small communities taking action, like working waterfront businesses or, or you know, ferry terminals or stores that are the only place to access groceries on an island. And so we work with critical businesses and municipalities and we we don't we don't work really closely with private homeowners. But uh, we just had a discussion about how how that's a huge gap and how the average homeowner is not going to be able to afford some of the upgrades that are needed. But it's it, it's um, it's certainly an issue to be tackled uh, as far as who to turn to. It, it's difficult for me to point the question asker in one particular direction, not knowing what their issue is. Um, the Maine Geological Survey has a specialist who works on saltwater intrusion in wells. And so if that's an issue, that would be where I would direct someone. If it's more like a, a bluff issue, it might be the Maine State Geologist or um, you know, shoreland zoning issues. It's hard, it's hard to know. Great, thank you. Um, Let's see, there was um, a question about, so this was more, question, we had a couple of questions related to future sea level rise. Um, one, someone was wondering, looking at, um, you showed the past rates of sea level rise and it looked like it was eight and a half inches and then kind of going up to like a foot and a half in recent times. Um, Yet the I, I think their question is, but it looks like the exponent the the projections by 2050 and by 2100 are a lot faster than if you just continue those lines forward at that same rate. So what's happening to make that rate of increase um, ha show up like that, and, and why is that the prediction um, for going forward? Why is there that extra risk? Yeah, I mean, it has to do with the emissions trajectory, like the, it has to do, it all has to do with how much emissions we emit. And so it, it is within our control to a certain extent. Now, it is true that a certain level of rise is already baked in based on emissions that have been like that, that we've already set into action the melting of land-based ice sheets that, you know, even if we stopped emitting all carbon emissions today, there would still be a continuation of, of melt. And so um, it really, those, those rates of rise are very much dependent upon different emission scenarios. Great, thank you. And that kind of feeds into another question that someone had submitted. They were wondering if there are any, I think you shared some really great 
computer models, but are there anywhere you can change some of those emission scenarios or the parameters that are affecting sea level rise to see their effects on what the rise might be? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, um, sounds like they're looking for some something pretty interactive. Um, and there is the sea level rise dashboard through the main moat weight dot org or is it dot org or dot gov it must be dot gov main moat weight the main act the main climate action plan website that has a sea level rise dashboard it's not as interactive as it sounds like this person is is asking for um the national oceanographic and atmospheric administration just released um its most up-to-date sea level rise report mm, two weeks ago and I'm not sure if they have any kind of interactive dashboard mm -hmm. to accompany that. There's also the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change, the IPCC reports. There's been a couple issued in the last year that um, the, the physical science basis that was released, I think, in August. Um, and I know that they have some interactive tools. That is a vast um, body of, of work that can be accessed online. So that might be where I would suggest this person go. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, you had a question asking about flash flooding and maybe how that ties into some of these other impacts and impacts that communities might see. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know, we don't, flash flooding is definitely going, definitely a concern. Um, I'm trying to think about how it relates to sea level rise. Um, you know, I think that it's more related to the, that storm, that tropical cyclone uh, slide that I showed with the increased incidence of really strong storms and um, those storms stalling over coastal areas that aren't used to seeing that type of precipitation event happen in really short periods of time. I mean, I think we can all um, probably agree that we've seen some pretty insane rainstorms over the last couple of years with lots of rain falling in a short period of time that I'm not used to seeing in this area. Um, yeah, so as far as flash floods go, I think that that would be more related to the, the increased storm frequency and an in, in increase in precipitation that the Northeast is seeing. Great, somebody was building on that question, kind of wondering how to elevate um, flooding concerns in the comprehensive planning. Yeah, that's a great question. Ruth, I don't know, do you have any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> well, um... I mean, you're, you're a little bit more connected with the comprehensive plans, maybe maybe you have an idea of how uh, the city of Bath is dealing with that now that we have a, a climate action commission is, you know, I know, you know, we, I don't know when our climate, our, when our comp plan was last updated, but I know it's definitely something that is on the radar. I mean, I just saw some data around um, the number of coastal communities, at least, who have, um, comprehensive plans. Oh no, Susie, did you just freeze? Or did I? Oh dear. Um, all right, we'll give it just another moment. I'm sorry, folks. Um, fingers crossed she's able to come back on. Um, I think in terms of the comprehensive planning, I'm not sure if I have too much to add, um, but I, I think that those resources that Susie mentioned um, on the um, Maine State Planning Office are really great to look at. So after this lecture, we will be sure that we send out um, links for all of the wonderful resources that Susie shared during the presentation. So, oh yeah, you're back. Um, so, so we will be sending links to all of these resources. Um, and Susie, do you mind if we share your PowerPoint as well? Yeah, I, that's no problem at all. I'll send you one that doesn't have a bunch of extra slides at the end. Okay. 
ended up Great. cutting out a bunch. So I'll send you a cleaned up version that can be shared. Perfect. Thank you. Um, are you good with spending a little more time on questions? Yeah, sure. Sorry. I don't know what happened with my internet. No, we're glad you're back. Thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, we had had, I think, a couple questions back on that individual planning realm. One was related to flood insurance and the impact of um, flood insurance on maybe letting homes be built in some vulnerable areas. And then another question from a homeowner wondering how, I guess, how to work with Maine DEP about increasing seal or seawalls or, or things that they can do on their property. Is it is it DEP that they'd work with? Are there, um, what are the other um, options? Homeowner. Okay, so. I just got just got thinking about affordable housing, which I know is not directly related to what you're asking. So someone was asking about flood insurance, what specifically about flood insurance is how the Island Institute started to first hear concerns about sea level rise. We started to hear from island businesses that were starting to get hit with astronomical premiums for flood insurance. Um, as people probably know, if you're going to buy a home in the in um, in a flood zone and you're going to get a federal federally backed mortgage you need to have flood insurance and that makes a lot of um homes out of reach for people who who can't afford those premiums and same same with businesses if they're paying off a federal mortgage and they're in the flood zone they have to have flood insurance so that's a that's a major issue for a lot of people but i'm not sure what the question was specifically about flood insurance I think um, this might have come during one of our convers one of the earlier conversations about um, the fact that having subsidized flood insurance has maybe allowed some homes to be built in oh, the flood zone that yeah. maybe shouldn't be there. Um, yeah, no, I mean the flood in the federal flood insurance program is not doing well. I guess is uh, putting it mildly, and it has, I think, in the past enabled a lot of people to build and rebuild in areas where we shouldn't be building. And I think part of the, you know, part of the point of having these state planning targets and making sure that um, regulations are now in line with those planning targets is so that we can avoid future development in vulnerable areas. So we don't have, we're not continuing to feed that cycle of developing in areas that are going to be flooded and then rebuilding in areas and leaving people homeless and then yeah having no place to put them and we already have a housing issue in Maine doesn't make sense to be putting housing where it's going to be flooded and I think this the next question is maybe from somebody who has a home in an area that is threatened by flooding and is wondering about um basically what what can you do um and I think it, it sounds like this person has worked with DEP um, to try and get seawall, like a larger seawall around their house um, or some other protections and has had some challenges. And so he's just trying to figure out what, what are the options? Where, any recommendations for where to look? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a challenge. And I, I, yeah, I think that's a really hard situation to be in. I, you know, I know that flood walls are, are tricky because they they may solve the problem for you but then they may create a a downstream problem for your neighbor where that person is where the flood wall ends that pe person is experiencing even more erosion than they were experiencing before so there's some real there real issues around around flood walls i know there's a lot of um legal cases around flood walls in places like florida where you know, even if your flood wall is one foot above your neighbors, you're disadvantaging your neighbor. So there's that there are a lot of issues with flood walls. Um, I'm definitely not an expert there. Um, I know that Pete Slavinsky at the Maine Geological Survey has um, put out some web based tools around like citing um, living shorelines and other types of green infrastructure. So that could be. Um, you know, another option to look into, it's hard to 
advise someone not knowing like if uh, do they have a is it a rocky shoreline is it an eroding bluff is it you know are they beachfront so there's different options for different um different types of of um land that's being inundated but i i can say that you know um I know he's been doing a great deal of work uh, around living shore shorelines and has some different sites in Maine experimenting with different living shoreline strategies in green infrastructure, like pounding uh, logs into, into bluffs to prevent erosion that um, doesn't, or hopefully doesn't create uh, negative downstream impacts for, to the neighbor. And so there's some, I think there's a test location in, in Brunswick. There's a test location. Ruth, do you remember where that other one is? Ah, uh, no, but it, all in Casco Bay area. They've done three test locations, I think, in Casco yeah. Bay. Um, so there are a couple of pilot projects to answer that very question to try to figure out. I mean, this is obviously it's a new body of work for everyone because this isn't a challenge that we've dealt with in history. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think something the Island Institute is interested in doing is looking out, even outside of the United States to see what uh, what strategies have been used that we can bring here and and. Uh, might be transferable to the coast of Maine. Great. Um, I think it looks like some of our last questions that came in. Um, one was about at what point does the planet restabilize itself? Like the ice is melting, CO two seems to keep growing. Like what is what is an end state? How do we get there? What would be what might things look like? I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry <laughs> no <laughs> we also had um i think the final question was what do you tell people who are feeling overwhelmed by climate projections yeah i mean i i that's why i include that that slide in there i mean i i've also been reading a little bit more on the science of hope and the elements that go into feeling hopeful and one of them is agency and in order to have agency you have to have information and knowledge in order to act um and so i think that you know i think it's really useful to know in that last slide that i showed how what individual actions you can take and how how do they add up and um you know i, I know that climate anxiety is a real thing and um one of the ways that i have heard to counter that anxiety is through individual action and in um and also joining in with community groups of of people who are also trying to take action and so you don't feel like you're in it alone um and so i think you know there's a lot of um a lot of reading that one could do to to read into the science of hope and also about individual actions and i would say just get involved in your in your local community as you're able and that's, you know, I, I work on this type of thing with, you know, 50 other committed colleagues at the Island Institute every day. So I have that camaraderie and that's really helpful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Susie, for sharing tonight. Um, it's been really wonderful having your presentation. Um, and I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, we'll be sending out the follow up email within the next week um, that will have a link to this recording um, for the presentation. And it will also include links to a lot of the resources she shared and a copy of her PowerPoint. So thank you all again. Um, and we hope to see you at another lecture. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody.